It's safe to assume that we've all heard of who Ted Bundy was. He was one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. What made this person so wicked, even amongst some of the sickest serial killers in history, was his choice of victims. Ted Bundy was largely infamous for kidnapping, sexually assaulting, and murdering women and young girls. There are a total of 30 confirmed homicides in Bundy's name, all of which were confirmed by the man himself during his confessions in 1989. However, the real number of his victims is expected to be much higher. Committing 30 murders and getting away with it for so many years showed the lengths he went to to avoid detection. So how was he finally caught and what led to his execution? Welcome to Crime Central. Join us today as we take a closer look into Ted Bundy's life. Bundy was born on November 24, 1946 as Theodore Robert Cowell and was believed to be an illegitimate child. His mother, Eleanor Louise Cowell, reported that Bundy was the son of an Air Force veteran known as Lloyd Marshall, but official reports still show his father's status as unknown. Being a bastard child, Ted was going to have difficulties living in a place that knew his origins all too well, which is why he spent the first three years of his life living with his maternal grandparents in Philadelphia. It did find out the truth about his parents later in life, and in later interviews he revealed that he hated his mother for keeping secrets of his father from him. He was also surprisingly positive while talking about his grandparents, though his grandfather was recognized as a wife beater and a highly abusive person with a rather dubious character. In 1951, Ted's mother Louise was married to Johnny Culpepper Bundy, who agreed to adopt Ted as his son, but Ted remained distant from his new family. His teenage days saw him roaming around the neighborhood searching trash cans for magazines of nude women. He would also drink a lot and then stay out late at night staring at people's windows, hoping that he'd get a glimpse of women undressing. It's clear that this man had issues from a very early period in his life. All criminals have a starting point, even serial killers, though he said that his first two murders were committed when he was visiting his family in Philadelphia in 1969. There are huge speculations that he had started killing since a very early stage in his life and way before 1969, but it wasn't until 1974 when his homicide started being documented. During this time Ted was 27 years old, the women he murdered in 1974 were mostly from the Evergreen State College and other colleges near the same vicinity, and these frequent disappearances of girls caused the local authorities to grow suspicious reports from people around the area from where these women disappeared pointed out a man on crutches struggling to carry his briefcase and asking for help. Bundy later revealed that he used this front to lure women to his Volkswagen Beetle, the car where Ted committed many of his crimes. Surprisingly enough, Bundy was caught numerous times in his life. His first trial was when he was caught by Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Hayward. Bundy was caught in Granger, but he did manage to flee initially before being taken into custody shortly afterwards. The authorities did check his apartment and his car thoroughly, but did not find anything that could be used as solid evidence, which led to Bundy being released. During a later interview, Bundy would reveal that the detective missed photographs of his victim, which was evidence enough to have him serve a sentence or quite possibly executed at that very time. His latter trials would not go well for him and also saw him escape. This story is particularly important because this was what cemented him as a true fugitive. In late 1977, Bundy escaped from the Glenwood Springs Jail. He broke into the chief jailer's apartment, stole his casual clothes, and then walked out of the front door of the jail. At this point, Bundy was a wanted man and had to lay low. Making any major move would result in his capture. He even revealed that after moving to Florida, he thought about stopping his criminal activities and getting a legal job all so he could remain undetected. That didn't work out for him as he kept reverting to his old habits. In Florida, Bundy broke into FSU's Chi Omega sorority and brutally assaulted some of the residents of the place. His confession later revealed that he tore the breast nipples of one of the victims, bit their buttocks, and attacked a victim so badly that she suffered permanent deafness, which resulted in the end of her dance career. After fleeing from FSU on February 12, 1978, Bundy felt that the police were closing in on him and he didn't have enough cash to pay the rent for his hideout, so he decided to make a run for it. Since Bundy did not own a vehicle of his own, 
He stole a car and drove westward across the Florida Panhandle. Three days after he stole the car, he was stopped by Officer David Lee near the Alabama state line. Bundy got into a small tussle with the officer, but Lee managed to subdue him and brought him to the station's cell, not realizing that he had arrested one of the most wanted men on the planet. There, Bundy told Lee, I wish you'd killed me, which shows just how much he did not want to face a lawful execution. The final capture led Bundy to face multiple trials, with most resulting against him. Bundy was very tenacious about defending himself in each of them. By this point, he'd become very efficient in the art of lying and deception. Bundy also experienced one of the most important moments of his life during one of his final trials when his longtime supporter Carol Ann Boone accepted his marriage proposal in the middle of the hearing. This led to the two getting legally married, as it was under the law of Florida that two people were to be legally married if they were to give their consent in front of a judge. Bundy had many supporters who believed in his innocence. The Leach trial was his final trial and after being sentenced to death by the jury, Bundy had realized that there was no point in fighting back now, and he agreed to do interviews with Stephen Mycod and Hugh Ainsworth, which he performed in a third-person perspective as he wanted to avoid confessing directly to the heinous crimes he'd committed. During these interviews, Bundy slowly revealed his motive and major drive for sexually assaulting and killing all of his victims. He started with his thieving habits, which he said were the key factor for him turning into a serial killer. He explained that he enjoyed having something, more specifically possessing something. That was completely for himself and thieving was a thrill for possession that he could never resist. The psychological state of this led him to develop a disorder where he said that killing these young girls and women made him feel like he truly possessed his victims. One of his most definitive sayings was the ultimate possession was in fact the taking of life and then the physical possession of the remains. He was truly driven by his sense of control and dominance over women which made him feel like the owner and controller of their lives. He also confessed that apart from his documented and reported crimes, he had killed countless other people during his life and the police were never aware of it, which is one of the main reasons why many people believe that Bundy had started killing ever since he was a teenager. Bundy finally met his end when he was executed by electric chair on January 24, 1989 at 7.16 a.m. It is reported that on the final eve of his execution, Bundy wanted to commit suicide and said that he didn't want the laws to have the pleasure of watching him die. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like this, check out one of the other videos on screen now. Subscribe and like the video, it's absolutely free but helps me make more videos for you guys.